Hello, my name is Dr. Paul Hazen. I'm a dermatologist here. And today's presentation is to discuss somewhat of the condition of hydratinitis suppurativa. Uh, it turns out that over the years we've seen many patients with this disease and many of the questions that patients have have been pretty uniform. And what we found is that so frequently the time that it took to put all those questions and answers together was something that really became the major thrust of a visit. And in order to make this whole thing more uh, easily done, we decided to put together this educational video. So that's the background of what we're going to be talking about here today. Uh, hydradenitis is a fairly common condition. It affects 1 to 4 percent of the population of the world. It's not just a U.S. disease. It's found in virtually every nationality. And as such, it is as common as psoriasis, and yet because it's hidden, many people don't have the same information available and don't have the same understandings that we would have for psoriasis. So this whole thing came about in order to really pass on our experiences as well as the information about the condition itself. In a hydratinitis, or we just sometimes refer to it as HS, is something that was first described by a fellow by the name of Verniel back in the 1800s. And the name for it, hydratinitis, hydra means gland and itis is inflammation. And to suppurate means to produce pus. So their original concept was that this was a disease that came from apocrine or the scent glands found in particularly increased areas of the body. And so when they were naming this thing, they said this looks like inflammation of the glands that produces pus, ergo the name. Turns out they were wrong. Uh, that this doesn't really happen because of inflammation of the glands, but rather it begins within the pore. Uh, it's a disease that there is no real test for. You know, it's not like having heart disease that you do a bypass thing and, or an angiogram and there it is. What happens is that it's a complex of findings. And so uh, what people find they have and really what defines the disease is that there are tender, recurring, inflammations occurring usually in the crease areas of the body, the underarm, the groin, the buttock bottom areas, under the bust areas for many women as well as fellows, uh, in which this inflammation swells up, it may drain, and then as it subsides, it no longer, it, it just doesn't disappear entirely, but it may act up time and again. And it's both the persistence and the long-lasting qualities as well as the the fact of it being this lumpy, boil-like process that people have described. Characteristic, too, is that you press here and you drain pus over here, and the tunneling that ultimately takes place with this is, again, very characteristic and almost part of what defines the process itself. Uh, people have this quite literally for years, where it gets better, it gets worse, it gets better, it gets worse, and this lasting quality of this is, again, part of the characteristic of what makes HS, HS. Uh, many therapies have been used for this and often people come in saying I've had all of this and that and our average length of time that we've seen people having this and looking backwards is somewhere in the order of nine years and we've had people who have had it quite literally for 20 years so it's not a process that's like a simple infection boil. Uh, gee I had it, it was treated and then it went away never to return. This is quite different, and indeed, even when one takes cultures of that posse material, uh, there are no pathogens, as they're called. There are no infectious things, even though it may look like MRSA, this methicillin staph. It is not MRSA, in spite of the fact that many people have been told, I think you've got MRSA. Uh, in terms of causations, uh, this is something that people look for, well, what is it that makes me have this? I want to stop doing this. Uh, and as it turns out, uh, infection things that people have looked at, they may get infected, but infection is not the main cause for this thing. What we now know to happen is that there is a hormone that's present in normal adults. Uh, we don't see this disease usually in children, but the adults' hormone make their way through the bloodstream to a point on the outside of the oil gland of a pore. And once that's captured there, it turns on that pore to produce the contents of oils and other things that make an adult pore an adult pore. Uh, what then happens is that this oil, which is manufactured from that pore, would normally make its way to the surface of the skin where it would then exit and then lubricate the skin. 
Instead, though, of being able to exit, it gets trapped inside. And it's basically, it just keeps producing, but it's got nowhere to go. And when it does that, building up, it then ruptures. And when that pore ruptures, there's all this inflammation that you and I see as this pussy, tender kind of thing. In addition, when it ruptures, part of the body repair process is to produce cells that are very much like your ear pierce. They, they line that area inside the skin to now make the same kind of tunnel that goes from the outside to the back of the earlobe, only it's now a tunnel that's under the surface of the skin and it goes from one pore to the next pore that becomes inflamed. And now we have the tunnel where I press here and I drain here. So this development of these tunnels as a result of the body's attempt to heal is one of the absolutely characteristic kind of things with this. Uh, it's something that's also challenging to prevent. And many people come in saying, well, I've read online all of these things. It's associated with being heavy, so people have said, well, I've lost 100 pounds. Well, that may or may not improve their hydroidinitis. We also know that other factors may play a part just besides body size. We know that for some reason, smoking seems to be associated with a greater severity of hydroidinitis also. But once again, like losing weight, simply stopping smoking will not necessarily even improve the hydroidinitis. So it's, it's, a, it's a factor, but it's a hit factor. It may not be the whole answer. We also have in question the issues of diet. Some people have wondered and have noted that for at least some individuals, dairy products might have a part to play in the cause of it, but it's again very inconsistent and just simply avoiding dairy products for many patients is not successful in taking it away. Again, it's another hit. Uh, we do have some people who do have elevated hormonal things within their system. They may have too much of certain hormones. Uh, that may be present for many people, but for most of our patients, the hormones that we test for are absolutely normal in quantity. It's what those hormones do at the outlet or the, at the point of the pore that seems to be the most crucial element for it. Many women will notice a cycling effect, particularly just before period time. Gee, my hydratinitis gets worse. And that's a not unusual thing. Uh, and again, it just underscores that hormones may play a part in this and it may indeed be part of what we look to for even developing certain treatments. Uh, there are some other associated elements to this condition. For example, if we look at other processes in which the pore structures may play a part, acne for example, over half of our patients have a history that they had some need for treatment for acne at some point in their lives. Uh, it's about 55% of people will have had a history of facial or chest acne. We also see in about 6 to 8% of people pimples and boils that happen in the scalp, sometimes to the point where, again, much like in the other areas of hydratinitis, you can see boils in the scalp. You may have hair loss and scarring that occurs because of that intensity. For many men, it's at the back of the scalp, right where the scalp joins the nape of the neck, and the same general process. We also know that for about 30% of people, there may be a cyst at the base of the tailbone, just under the tailbone, it's called a pilonidal cyst, uh, often seen not just in the patient who's there, but also in family members. Uh, a history of this pilonidal sinus or pilonidal cyst is not uncommon. Again, in about 30% of people, there's a family history. Somebody comes in saying, you know, I got hydradenitis, you know, dad had boils. And that's a really common thing. Whether they ever had the diagnosis of hydradenitis or not, uh, the fact that other members of the family might have had boils is really common. And it just underscores, they may not have got a name for it, but this sort of relationship with inflamed pore structures in these crease areas is just really, really common. Uh, we have, in some individuals, very strong family histories, mother to daughter to daughter, and that kind of thing. And uh, what we find is that in the literature, in the publishings of this whole thing, uh, there are at least three large families in which at, at least four generations of individuals have been found to be. Uh, something was described in the Japanese, as well as Chinese, as well as English uh, populations of patients. And they've even been able to try to isolate this to a specific chromosome. Again, this just underscores that uh, for most individuals that have this, 
the things of, gee, you're doing something wrong, you're too heavy, you're smoking, you're doing this, you're doing that, is not nearly as important as the genetics of what makes us us. And it's just sort of like saying, how come some people have acne and other people don't? This is part of our genetic and the chemistry of our makeup. Uh, in terms of other inflammation or associated kinds of diseases, we find that other inflammation processes, for example, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease, uh, ulcerative colitis, are both much more often seen associated with hydradenitis than one would expect by chance alone. Same is true for arthritis. A lot of people will come in, some noticing, gee, uh, I've been to see my arthritis doctor, they've checked me for things like rheumatoid arthritis, but all I have is uh, hydradenitis. And in some individuals, we've treated their hydradenitis, and indeed their arthritis has completely disappeared. So there is this relationship. Two other diseases that you'll hear or perhaps read about, and also in which there is inflammation associated at times with hydradenitis, is something called sweet syndrome, and a separate ulcerative condition usually occurring on the legs, called pyoderma gangrenosum. What this then truly represents is a total body inflammation that may take place of which the skin is certainly participating, but other parts of the body may be inflamed as well. Uh, a lot of people say, well, how bad is my hydradenitis? And one of the things that everyone has looked for is a yardstick, uh, not only to judge how severe is RHS, but also to try to gauge improvements in whatever therapy you're using. And a fellow by the name of Hurley, H-U-R-L-E-Y, was the first to say, well, I can kind of gauge how severe an individual's HS is uh, by noting what kinds of spots do they have. And a Hurley stage one is now recognized as just a single area of severe inflammation that's there. Maybe very persistent, and uh, we've had folks that have had 20 years of one boil, but that's still the only spot they've ever gotten, the ergo of early stage one. Early stage two, which is a bit more severe, may have more than one area, but with limited tunneling. So the early stage three, the most severe staging, is where there are more than two areas in which there is more extensive tunneling. Now this is a pretty, broad category because some people have terrible stage three, other people have more focused stage three, but indeed this is a, a system of categorizing how severe is our condition. Uh, there's another condition or another grading system also known as the Sartorius scale, and again names aren't important, but just the fact that people have been trying to pinpoint how bad and how do we tell how much hydradenitis an individual has. A Sartorius system tries to assign a value. If you got one underarm area, it's three points. You got two underarms, it's three plus three. At a grind, it's another three. And you then, by noting how wide are the tunnels, how long are the tunnels, how many bumps do we have, one can begin to assign a number value for how bad is it. What neither of those systems really, however, measure is, well, how much pain am I having? How much odor is there associated with the drainage? How much am I staining my clothing because of the drainage which is there? And these are the things that people with HS have to live with. And indeed, we're beginning to recognize that in a broader scale, there is something called the, dramato, the Dermatologic Life Quality Index, or we'll talk about it as the DLQI. And this is a measure by which we, have, we determine how much is this disease really affecting an individual. And it's not just for HS but the DLQI has also been used in psoriasis and many other conditions that are chronic and affecting skin. And needless to say, the DLQI in hydradenitis patients, if people are, are severely affected by this disease. Uh, all of the things we just talked about makes it difficult and challenging for personal relationships with other people, with jobs and employment, because it's hard to do all that when you're sitting on pus and other kinds of tender areas. Treatments. You know, it, everyone has looked for the differences of, well, what may help this disease? And it's almost, I think, helpful to divide the treatments and their focus into those things that are geared at trying to control the right now inflammation of that spot right at the moment versus those treatments that are to try to get rid of the more lasting chronic kinds of things. In general, for either a very limited early stage one, for example, kind of thing, all of the focus of treatment is to try to get that area so it doesn't hurt anymore. 
And these anti-inflammation things, sometimes they're used as shots of medicine directly into the spots of the boils. Sometimes they may be antibiotics. Uh, although, interestingly enough, antibiotics don't work because they're killing germs. They work as anti-inflammation agents. Uh, that's one of the importance in concepts of this because, you know, you take an antibiotic for a boil and the infection is cleared in a, in a few days, up to a week or more. Uh, this is not something that you're taking just to kill germs. And as such, it's a medicine that people will need to take as an antibiotic perhaps for many months or even longer. And one must be able then to choose medicines that if they're needed for a longer period, that are safe to take. It's like treating high blood pressure. It's like treating diabetes. You don't take medicine for a week. You take the medicine for as long as that condition needs to be kept under control and to be kept in therapy. Uh, so antibiotics are another thing. Sometimes combinations of antibiotics. Sometimes other medications that have anti-inflammatory properties. There's a medicine called Dapsone. Uh, another medicine called rifampin. Names, again, not so key. is just the fact that there is a whole selection of choices that are each geared at trying to help to take away the tender and flame spot right now, uh, as well as to try to keep the, the development of new ones from appearing. In addition, uh, we find that there are uh, certain medications that can be used to try to stop some of that first effect. We talked about the hormones and how hormones may turn on these pores. Uh, in some women, you can block this effect of that receiver, that receptor as it's called, that in turn turns on the pores. In many men, there's a little downstream as it's called. There's a little bit further along in how these hormones do their thing. There's a medicine that may turn off some of the effects of those hormones. They don't change the amount of the hormones. The hormone levels are normal. You don't want to change those. But what it does is it changes how the body, in this bad way, seems to react to the presences of those hormones. Uh, we also have some patients in whom they say, well, we've tried doing things to try to open up some of that pore. Uh, the vitamin A compounds, for example, Accutane is a classic medication used for complexions for acne kinds of treatments, very powerful medication. Yet it doesn't seem to work very well in treating hydradenitis. No one is quite sure why it doesn't. Why does a poor respond well to that medicine here, but not respond to that same medication in other places? Some of the other vitamin A derivative compounds may, however, have some greater benefits. Some patients will show improvement, other patients do not. What you're seeing then is that there's a whole menu of options for things that may try to control gee, this is the red hot spot there right now, and they kind of then lend themselves also into the next phase of controlling the tenderness of these areas, which is something that you have to stay on then for longer periods of times. Uh, the last element for kind of addressing this is, well, what about this spot that's been there for so long and that has all of that tunneling? Will these other medications control it? And the answer is they may reduce the inflammation, but if the tunnel is there, the tunnel is there. And in our experience, at least, so long as that tunnel remains, things that try to reduce pain will do exactly that, but no more. And until or unless you're committed to really getting rid of that tunnel, you will indeed continue to have problems with this thing reactivating, and again, it quiets down and then acts up and flares once again. We've tried to avoid lancing, if possible, because the lancing of that produces another issue of tunnel. And so it may relieve acute pain, but as far as a long-term thing, just simply lancing areas that are like that doesn't work. Uh, on the other hand, doing something that may remove fully that area, whether it's done with using a, a cold steel, as it's called, a scalpel, where you uh, have the area anesthetized or the person anesthetized and cut around it, uh, that seems to be very successful, at least for some people, to get rid of that. A large, lumpy, tender kind of mass. And in a lasting fashion, if you got it all out, you're in good shape. Unfortunately, in some individuals, you may think you got the whole thing out, but there may be unseen extensions that it may go below the skin that you just can't see doing that surgery. And unfortunately then, for some individuals, it'll come back. We also see in some patients that if one is grafted or flapped, skin, stretch skin to try to stitch up the area that's had surgery, once again there seems to be a greater risk of having things come back. 
Uh, one of the treatments that we have been using with a fair amount of success over the years is to use a carbon dioxide laser to help us in the removal of these not only visible parts, but we can also, in the use of this, identify where the tunnels and tracks go. And it's kind of a special focus of therapy that we've sort of been using uh, more so than many other people just because we've had the experience of doing it. And in our hands, what we've seen is, is something less than 2% of any of the patients that we've treated have had spots that have returned. It can even be used for other areas such as the scalp. It can be used for the pilonidal sinus that we've talked about. So it seems to have applications for not just hydratinitis where you see it in these principal crease areas, but for other locations that are associated elements to it as well. Um, other therapies should be used because even though you go ahead and you treat the main thing, uh, the risk for everyone is that they will continue to develop new spots as well. So really all of the, th the treatments that we've tried to underscore for patients is let's help you get rid of the old spots that are just always going to be a problem for you, but at the same time, let's consider what treatments might be of value to try to prevent new ones from coming too. It's a complicated issue, it's a terrible disease, uh, we've had great successes, we're looking forward to greater successes, and part of our thing here is to always explore and to try to make available to people those things that we hope will be the newest and the best of these kinds of treatments. Uh, we'll go over a lot of these things as we have opportunity to meet with patients and we look forward to discussing more in detail each person's individual elements of what makes their problems their problems. Thank you for listening. Uh, what we've covered so far has to do with more of a verbal description of this and what I'd like to do is to show you some of what we've been talking about. Uh, one of the first things we see in many patients, we've been talking about how follicles aren't normal. And one of the things that we see for a whole bunch of folks is what's been called the polycomodonal follicle. And that's a mouthful. Basically, it's where you see two or three blackheads that will all enter into the pore at the same time. Uh, you'll see it behind the ears, you'll see it over the chest, you can see it almost any place you've got pores. Uh, but that's a characteristic thing. You don't see this in many other skin conditions, but it's a characteristic thing for some patients at least that have hydratinitis. Uh, in addition, uh, we talked about how there are these different stages, early stage one, stage two, stage three. Early stage one, for example, and we're going to show a picture as we do this, uh, is a single solitary lump as is seen in this particular picture. Uh, Hurley stage 2, which again we're showing, uh, shows the features of multiple spots but with limited tunnels and a Hurley 3 uh, shows a confluent, meaning all one big pocket area in which once again press over here and drain over here with this tunneling that goes under the surface of the skin. In addition to, gee, this is what it looks like as the condition, I also want to show you some pictures of what we've seen and get, more get people the, the comfortableness of, well, what is this thing? Uh, here's a patient, for example, that has hydradenitis. It's a severe pocket of stuff in an underarm area. This is what it looked like before we did the surgery. Uh, without grossing people out, this is what it looks like after the surgery, and this just underscores the extensiveness of this. And very commonly in an underarm area, it'll be on the chest, it will be in the underarm, but going right up into the underarm. It will then go on to the arm areas, and this is what you can see for this kind of individual. The qualities of healing, even without plastic or reconstructive surgery, though, can be remarkable. It's comfortable, and this is the quality of healing that we would expect and hope to see for everybody. And it's fairly representative of seeing that. That's exciting because it no longer hurts. You know, the drainage is basically gone. So these are just some examples, and again, the, the visual combined with what we've been talking about is what we hope to accomplish by just having to get a, get a better feel for this. Thank you.